period from 1885 through the start of World War I saw a flurry of activity throughout the industrialized world in the development of the infantry rifle. There were many competing designs, such as Mauser, Lee, Hotchkiss, Craig, Jorgensen, LaBelle, Monlicker, Viterli, Kropotchik, each with its own unique set of advantages and disadvantages. The adoption of any one particular design over another was as much caught up in questions of national pride as it was in superiority of design. Further, many of these designs went up dead-end streets as they were chambered for black powder cartridges, rim fire cartridges, had tubular magazines, or had some other problem. Some of these designs recovered from their problems and got back into the mainstream of development. Others never recovered and simply disappeared from the scene. Even worse, some of these weapons were adopted and issued by the nations involved before the design itself had reached its maximum potential. All of the designs we mentioned were basic variations of the turnbolt design, the idea for which came from the Mauser single-shot breech loader of 1871. By the start of World War I, almost all weapons that had been adopted were bolt action of one sort or another. They all used cartridges with smokeless powder and jacketed Spitzer bullets and had some sort of integral magazine with charger loading. As a good generic representative of the bolt action magazine rifle, we have picked the Pattern 17 Enfield. This rifle borrowed a little bit from the Lee, the Mauser, and a few other designs, and was to be, along with the new 276 Magnum cartridge, the British rifle for 1914. World War I put a stop to its issue. The tooling was transferred to the United States, and the rifle was made in 303 caliber for the British from 1915 until 1917 when we entered the war. The tooling was then converted to 30 caliber, and the rifle became general issue for US forces in World War I. Most bolt actions were simple, yet robust. In order to operate, the firer grasped the bolt handle and lifted it, thereby unlocking the bolt. He then drew the handle to the rear, thereby extracting the cartridge in the chamber, and at the rear of bolt movement, ejecting the cartridge out of the weapon. If the rifle was empty, then the follower in the magazine would rise, blocking forward motion of the bolt and telling the shooter that he needed to reload the weapon. The shooter then took his magazine charger, normally a disposable stripper clip holding five rounds of ammunition, and placed it in a corresponding notch milled into the receiver bridge. He pressed all five rounds downward with his thumb and then discarded the stripper clip. Forward motion of the bolt would then pick up the top round in the magazine, driving it forward into the chamber. Downward motion of the bolt would then lock the weapon. Depending upon design, at some point during the lifting of the bolt handle or the forward motion of the bolt, the cocking piece and firing pin would be cocked and held by the sear. Upon pressing the trigger, the sear was depressed, and the firing pin released to go forward and fire the cartridge. The shooter then grasped the bolt handle, lifting it upward, and the cycle started all over again. All bolt action magazine rifles had some sort of adjustable sights. The most common were like this Mauser, an open sight mounted on the barrel. Though it is ballistically a very good sight, it is actually difficult for the shooter to use. Of the various designs, the best was a peep or aperture sight mounted on the receiver bridge. This placed it close to the shooter's eye. 
had the longest sight radius and was the easiest for the shooter to recover his sight picture after he took his face away from the stock in order to work the bolt. In the case of the P-17, this sight was adjustable to 1,600 yards. Normally, however, a shooter was only trained to estimate the range for the target and independently fire at targets to 1,000 yards. Anything over 1,000 yards was normally volley fire with the range and the firing commands given by the squad leader or the platoon commander. In some armies, marksmanship training was given little attention. In others, rifle marksmanship was considered to be the primary soldierly quality. The British are a good example of this. They had learned their lesson in the Boer War, and in the early 1900s, their emphasis on marksmanship made them one of the better armies in the world. The U.S. Army also placed great emphasis on individual rifle marksmanship, and numerous marksmanship exchange programs had been engaged in between U.S. and British rifle clubs since the 1870s, and on an official basis between the armies from the 1900s. In fact, the first Wimbledon Cup was a rifle marksmanship award between the two nations. In those nations that did emphasize individual rifle marksmanship, the sling was not simply a carrying strap, as you use today, but served double duty to help stabilize the weapon during firing. The sling on this P-17 is of such a type. The shooter got into it like this. The sling helped steady the rifle prior to and during discharge, help reduce the movement of the weapon during recoil, and help the shooter reacquire the sight picture. This latter can be quite important. The reacquiring of the sight picture after working the bolt frequently took more time than the working of the bolt itself. You can see the advantage of the sling. The British Army in particular conducted a great deal of training on the manipulation of the bolt and reacquisition of the sight picture. We'll show you a P-17 in action against pop-up targets at three ranges and against a fourth stationary target at 680 yards. As you watch this, you'll note the shooter make a major error and then correct himself partway through. See if you can spot it. Before we go to the chart and compare the bolt action, what error do you think you spotted? In fact, the error was that when the shooter finished engaging the targets at 330 yards, which was at the edge of his battle sight range, he should have adjusted the sights before engaging the target at 680 yards. He fired his first shot without this adjustment, and the round hit well short. After adjusting the sight, he hit close to the target though to one side. The wind was very, very heavy on the day that he was firing, and that miss was caused by wind drift. Though not shown on the tape, 
By the fifth round, he was putting the shots right in there. On the chart, it looks like this. The superiority of the bolt action over the single shot breech loaders, and we're using the 1873 Springfield as a generic example, is quite obvious. Though the battle site range on this P-17 was 370 yards, this could vary from one rifle cartridge combination to another to between 320 and 370 yards. The maximum adjust site range could be one or 200 yards less, again depending upon the rifle and cartridge combination. Also remember that 1,000 yards did not represent the maximum distance that the bullet would travel. Firing in volley, effective fire could be delivered at greater ranges. In fact, British rifles before World War I had sight adjustments to 2,600 yards, and they regularly conducted volley fire training out to 1,900 yards. For volume of fire, you can see that the bolt action has roughly double the volume of the single shot. The bolt action's primary advantages in volume of fire are its magazine charging with the stripper clip and the relatively small motions that have to be made in order to reload the rifle. This volume of fire for the bolt action on the chart assumes recovery of the sight picture and taking a few seconds per round to aim precisely at one of the longer range targets. At closer ranges, such as 150 yards or less, where precise sight picture was not all that important, recovery after recoil was much faster, and the volume of fire would frequently go up to 20 rounds per minute. The effect of this drastic increase in both volume of fire and combat range in just a few short years is almost legendary. The trench warfare of World War I was a direct outgrowth of the bolt-action rifle a water-cooled machine gun, and the new breed of artillery. Though you'll study World War I in great detail, suffice it to say that airplanes, mechanization, radios, and a number of other things had not yet appeared. These would help redress the balance and make the offense equivalent in strength to the defense. Without these things, World War I became stagnant. The no man's land between the two lines was very appropriately named. Moving in the open in no man's land, facing an enemy armed with these bolt-action magazine rifles was risky business indeed.